and very reverend fathers, sisters, honorary audience. Christos Anesti. Um, we are Hier Monk Jeremia and Monk Arsenios from Putna Monastery in Romania. First, we would like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting us here. It is a great honor for our monastery and a great blessing. Obviously, our digital experience is incomparable to Pentusia. We will have a modest contribution to this conference, but we hope maybe it will be not useless. So uh, what we will do is we will try to say a few words today about our monastery's presence into the digital world as an attempt to echo its ethos. So we'll start by presenting this ethos and we couldn't think of a better way than via a short movie. And then after the movie we will uh, overview the um, pro digital products of the monastery and at the end outline a few principles uh, that we follow when we produce these digital products. So let's start with the ethos. The Puna Monastery is an ancient monastic settlement. The archaeological investigations showed traces of monastic life as early as the beginning of the 14th century. In its current form, it dates back to 1466, when the ruler of Moldavia, Prince Stephen the Great, laid the foundation of the church, which he dedicated to the Dormition of the Mother of God. Its founder, Stephen the Great, was declared the greatest Romanian of all times. He was canonized by the Romanian Orthodox Church in 1992 for being a great defender of the faith and a great benefactor of the Church. He built more than 34 churches and monasteries in Moldavia. He was a great benefactor of Zografu Monastery, in fact, its second founder, and of Hilandar and Vatopedi monasteries from Mount Athos. At Vatopedi, he built the refectory and the seaport. The Putna Monastery inherits a rich patrimony, such as illumined manuscripts from the 15th century. One of the most valuable collections of Byzantine embroideries from Southeastern Europe. Icons painted at Putna by Moscow masters during the 15th century. Silver and gold sacred objects and so on. Beside various workshops and the scriptorium, the monastery also had a school of Byzantine music, which was one of the most renowned at that time. Throughout the centuries, the monastery went through many tribulations, fires, earthquakes, pillages from various foreign armies. Consequently, the church had to be reconstructed in 1653. Between 1775 and 1918, the entire region Bukovina was occupied by the Austrian Empire. Its administration imposed a lot of restrictions on the monastic life, which resulted in one of the most difficult periods in the history of the monastery. In the Second World War, the monastery was almost blown off by the retreating German troops, being spared at the intercession of a monk of the monastery. After that, the communist regime and its oppression came along. All these contributed to the marks of orthodoxy being imprinted on this place. Romania's national poet, Mihai Minescu, called Putna the Jerusalem of the Romanian people and the tomb of Stephen the Great, the altar of the national conscience. In keeping with the spirit of its founder, 
would now remain the place with great openness towards the entire Orthodox world. Being a symbol of the Romanians, it is visited by many Orthodox personalities. For instance, in 2004, the Ecumenical Patriarch, His All Holiness Bartholomew, placed a candle on the tomb of Stephen the Great as a sign of gratitude for the help he granted to the Christians from the territories under the Turkish yoke. The current monastic rule was laid down in 1956 by Father Cleopa Ilie, the renowned elder. He spent a few months at Putna, bringing along several young monks who became the backbone of the monastery for the following decades. That foundation allowed Putna to enjoy a great period of stability. Since 1962, there have been only three abbots, Archimandrite Gerasim, Archimandrite Yakint, and Archimandrite Melchizedek, the current abbot. Maybe the greatest treasure of Putna is the choir of the fathers who sanctified themselves in this place throughout time, starting with its holy founder Stephen the Great and his counselor, Saint Daniel the Hermit. Continuing with Hierarch Elia Iorest, confessor of the faith against the Calvinists, Metropolitan Jacob, the second founder of the monastery, along with his close collaborators, which have fragrant holy relics, up to our fathers from the 20th century, Bishop Gerasim, the former abbot, Achimandrite Yakint, who fell asleep while on the confessor chair, having the gift of the prayer of the heart, Hieroschema monk Caesarius, Hieroschema monk Damascene, Archdeacon Theophilact, who didn't miss a single church service, having also the gift of the prayer of the heart, and so on. All of them created with God's help a spiritual atmosphere of grace and peace, which is sensed even by foreign tourists. They are our foundation. They are our strength. Beside all that has been said, one of our main legacies is this, an open monastery ministering to the people of the Lord. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the presentation continues. I hope, yes. So now let's, um, we saw a, bit, a glimpse of what Buddha Monastery and its mission are. Uh, now let's uh, look over its digital project, product. So we start with the official start of the monastery, which features its history, an overview of uh, its main treasures, the art collections, a photo gallery, Byzantine music sung by the fathers of the monastery, its publications, all available for free download. The most creative part of this site is uh, dedicated to the monastery, monastery's yearly youth magazine, Words for the Young. This magazine is an attempt to present orthodoxy, the, tr the true life in the church, the tr true life in Christ from our perspective. As such, it always includes facts about the histor history, spiritual words from the fathers, interviews with Romanian foreign prominent personalities, a pro-life section, conversions to the faith, articles about hush, hot issues of our time. We, here we want to point out that we agree with the conclusion of Dr. Danilova from yesterday that real life testimonies are the solution. They do work, they do attract people's hearts. This is our experience too. In keeping with the legacy of the place, we try to echo the life of the Universal Church with articles about orthodoxy around the world. So we had articles about orthodoxy in Japan, France, the US, Syria, Russia, Serbia, Tanzania, and so on. Here you can see some of the persons we featured in the past. This year, with God's help, we will feature His Beatitude Metropolitan Onufri, Primate of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, Frederica Matthews Green, and others. Some of our articles were reposted or translated by various sites on the internet, 
such as Pentusia, the Romanian version, the Russian side, Pravoslavie, Datru, and others. For instance, the conversion story of Adam Matthew's family ranked seven last, last year on Pentusia.ro. We also have YouTube, Facebook, and Google Plus accounts. Also, we dedicated a site to our founder, Stephen the Great, with a lot of resources, an excellent bi bibliographical resource for high school students and others interested. Within the historical realm, the Stephen the Great Resource and Documentation Center of the Putna Monastery owns two sites. One, this one, dedicated to the activities of the center with updates of events in Romanian and English, its publications, and other things. The other side of the center is dedicated to its main publication, the biannual scientific journal, The Annals of Putna. This site publishes both Romanian and English abstracts for the articles in the 17 issues published by now. Actually, I went too, too, too fast, I think. This uh, is a history journal which is indexed in European databases. We end the overview of the digital products with what is probably the most dynamic presence of the Puna Monastery on the internet, that is the collaboration with the online radio, Orthodox Radio. This radio webcasts live services from the Puna Monastery, including the sermons. All of these are available for later download. For us, it was a surprise to learn of the positive impact these webcasts had. We had Romanians who visited the monastery and went abroad and remained in touch with the monastery via this radio. And the other situation of Romanians listening to, to the radio and then coming to Putna. Um, beside other testimonials, a very encouraging message for our mission came from a Romanian woman from Ireland who called and told us that a good friend of her recovered from deep depression after listening to the sermons. This encouraged us. Now, um, we would like to outline several principles of our activity. Puna Monastery's presence in the digital world is organic, is consultative, and it's done under spiritual supervision. By organic, we mean that it tries to echo the ethos of the monastery, in particular by combining the openness towards novelty, towards development, with the necessity of preserving the authentic Orthodox spirit. It is organic also in the, same, in the sense that it aims at mediating a personal contact with the life of the church, and by personal contact, we mean not just the contact via the digital media, but the actual life in the church, meaning having a spiritual father, partaking of the holy mysteries of the church, and so on. It is also organic in another lesser, but very important way, uh, respect, that is, it depends on the IT specialists God sent to our brotherhood, and on their other obediences within the monastery. It is consultative in the sense that each digital project is discussed in a larger circle with several monastics ending up working on it actively. And these monastics that work, they take counsel with each other and with others from the monastery. And by being done under spiritual supervision, we mean that everything is done with a blessing and um, other monastics not necessarily from the digital circle, uh, get the chance to see this project, uh, projects and make observations. Plus, all the projects are reviewed by Father Abbott. We think that these characteristics of being organic, being done after consultation, and being spirit done under spiritual supervision are necessary conditions for the pastoral care in the digital world to remain orthodox, to preserve the spirit of the Holy Fathers, even if it dresses the new cloths of the modern world. And preserving the spirit of the Fathers is paramount. Let me end with a short story. Elder Cleopa, a renowned Romanian elder, 
which we, you saw in the movie too, after the fall of communism in Romania was taken by an enthusiastic bishop to see the monasteries that had been built up in the meantime. Elder Klopa went and saw them and said, as long as I know myself, I haven't heard of making cheese without rennet. What is he talking about? We, we, we took him to see the monasteries and he talks us about cheese. The others groaned. But the elder continued, you cannot make cheese without rennet and a monastery without a good spiritual father. Where are you going to get them? And I think this applies to the pastoral care too. Every, every work actually done in the church requires good spiritual fathers. And where are we getting to get them? Let us not forget thus that genuine pastoral care is about giving birth. As St. Paul said, my little children for whom I suffer birth pangs until Christ be formed in you. Let us not forget that when we talk about pastoral care, we talk about sacrifice, we talk about cross. And cross, says another great Romanian elder, means to bear what you don't like. It's easy to talk, it's hard to give birth. We should keep that in mind. Thank you very much, please forgive me. Christos Anestem. <laughs>